So, the key parameter to understand if the USA turned around the kinematic disadvantage of the current air-to-air -air weapons if compared with Chinese and the Russian missiles is the max range. We calculate the max range for the AIM-174 and the result is... I don't use the word lightly, but I think that the AIM-174B is indeed a game-changer. Why do you think so, sir? Because, Otis, I have reason to think that when deployed at scale, it will largely fill a gap of capability that the US currently has in the context of a potential conflict with China and Russia. Interesting. What is the AIM-174B? Have you been living under a rock? No. I am living here, sir. On the charger, most of the time. So what is the AIM-174B is a variant of the surface-to-air SM-6 missile in use with the US Navy and a few others. This variant can be air-launched and some pictures have emerged of F-18Es carrying the missile. But our viewers, I'm sure, already know this. Our viewers are very knowledgeable. Uh, Otis, may go on with the video? Thank you. In 2011, the Chinese news outlet People's Daily reported about a successful test of an unidentified next-generation air-to-air missile. At the time, the mainstay of the PLAF was the excellent PL-12 medium-range missile, which was considered in the West roughly equivalent to an Amram-C of the first generations. The first semi-official confirmation that a new air-to-air -air missile was in the making appeared in September 2015. In 2017, though, the first pictures of J-10 Chinese fighters equipped with the new missile started to appear. The new weapons seem to be slightly larger than the PL-12 and larger than the AMRAM. It is equipped with an AESA radar seeker and a secure data link that allows the missile guidance from a remote platform like an OWAX or a fighter other than the launcher. Overall, it is considered a modern weapon capable of trading blows with the AMRAM D. Or better, this was the assessment at the beginning. Further intelligence and analysis revealed that the PL-15 had one big advantage over the AMRAM, even the D variant. The maximum range was estimated to be about 300 kilometers, about 50% more than the American counterpart. If you follow the channel, you know what the meaning of the operational range in the public domain really is. It's not like a car that runs for a certain number of kilometers and when it runs out of fuel, it stops. The range usually quoted is the max range against a cooperative target at the moment of the launch, where a cooperative target is an aircraft flying straight and level toward the launch point. That is, this is the range in the easiest condition that basically never happens. However, the max range is a good proxy for the kinematic capability of the weapon, that is, how good the weapon is at chasing a target. There is much more to this topic, but we can consider that number a rough representation of the performance. Moreover, the ranges that we know are probably wrong for secrecy reasons, but probably they're not wrong by much because they must be credible. Declaring either a too short or too long performance would not be credible. Intelligence services at the end of the day are more interested in other kinematic parameters, but we in the public domain, um, we just have that. To be clear, the actual range against a target moving toward the launcher and capable of maneuvering is probably about two-thirds of the maximum range if we want a decent probability of intercept. If we are firing against a target that is moving sideways in respect to the launcher, the range is less than one half. If you are firing against a target that is running away, the range is seriously, seriously much shorter than the max range. These are rules of thumb 
there are so many variables that influence the missile capability to reach a target either technological or inherent to the tactical situation, but they just give you an idea of the complexity of the calculation. In July 2018, a short press release from the Russian Ministry of Defense let the world know that the new R-37M air-to-air missile was accepted in service after the successful completion of a test where the weapon hit a target at a distance of 300 kilometers. The R-37 has origins deep into Soviet times when a weapon to replace the big R-33 was required. The development was arrested in the 90s with the collapse of the Soviet Union, but the work done became the basis for a substantially more modern weapon that entered in service in 2018 to equip the latest variants of the MiG-31. Launched at high supersonic speed by a MiG-31, the R-37 is accredited of a maximum reach of about 400 kilometers. The missile reaches hypersonic speed in part of its trajectory, and despite its bulkiness and weight, it turned out surprisingly capable to engage maneuvering targets and small fighters at a long range, with a percentage of success estimated by some sources above 80% in Ukraine. The R-37M scored the longest air-to-air -air kill in history in October 2022, when a Ukrainian Su-27 flanker was shot down at a distance of 217 kilometers from the launch point. Nothing like that is available in the American inventory. The European Meteor could trade blows with such a weapon, but it is an entirely different category of missile, so the comparison is probably not very meaningful. In 2016, a photo of a J-16 appeared on the Chinese internet. That would not have been anything special if it wasn't for the payload underslung the right wing. A new, never seen before, missile appeared in the picture. It was quite long but relatively thin, and it seemed a new iteration of a very long-range weapon. In October 2022, the Chinese media reported that the new weapon, dubbed PL-17, had entered operational service. The estimated range of the PL-17 is about 400 kilometers. Once again, way more than any American counterpart. But this time, finally, the United States responded. In June 2019, US officials made known to the public that a successor of the AIM-120 was in the works. Its name is the AIM-260 Jatman. It was declared that the first studies began in 2017 and the weapon would be a general improvement over the AMRAAM with heavy emphasis on longer range. It was explicitly mentioned that this weapon was a reply to the Chinese PL-15 and it was explicitly designed with the same form factor as the AIM-120 to fit inside the F-22 base. The missile was scheduled to enter service in 2022, and for a while everything was good. Then, 2022 passed, we had news of tests being conducted in great secrecy, then 2023 came, and we had news of even more secret tests. Now it is 2024, and we still know nothing about the AIM-260. By now, we should have had pictures of the weapon, and a few more indiscretions should have been leaked. Delays in a complex program are normal. This level of secrecy is not. Basically because an air-to-air -air missile is something visible to everyone looking. So, I think that something must be wrong with that program, and maybe just maybe, now, we have proof of it. In April 2021, some strange photos emerged from the internet. An aviation photographer pictured by chance an F-18F with a strange payload. It was a RIM-174, or better, an SM-6-like missile hanging from an underwing pylon. The missile was painted with a strange color scheme and without the booster that is used for the vertical launch from the ship VLS. 
Yes, because the SM6 is a long-range surface-to-air missile, a modern and versatile one, with limited anti-ballistic capabilities and a secondary anti-ship role. I didn't really know what to do with that picture and a few others that emerged till July 2024, a few weeks ago. In the context of the large RIMPAC naval exercise, a few pictures of Super Hornets armed with either inert or live weapons appeared in the press. The US Navy, in a short note, mentioned that the AIM-164B is now operationally deployed. The first consideration is that, for the American standards going from the first tests to the operational deployment in four, maybe five years, is almost an emergency program. But then, leaving this aside, what are the challenges of turning a surface launch missile in an air-to-air -air weapon? Well, first of all, it must be aerodynamically compatible and capable of safely separating from the platform. That was probably what was being tested when the first pictures emerged. The missile structure must probably be strengthened because it normally sits vertically while protected inside a box on a ship, while now it is hanging from the side of a maneuvering aircraft. With such a big and heavy load, the F-18 is probably limited in terms of max load factor anyway. Moreover, the coupling hardware must be added to the missile. This is to physically hang it to the coupler and to connect it with the aircraft armament subsystem. For these reasons, I don't expect that a surface launch RIM-174 could be interchangeable with an air-launched AIM-174. And obviously, the aircraft must be integrated with the weapon and the armament subsystem must be capable of providing the weapon with a firing solution that the missile could understand. In terms of software and guidance, though, I don't expect that the AIM-174 was difficult to adapt. The seeker was originally derived from the AMRAM, and with more room and the acceptance of a high cost per round, I don't see any conceptual issue in developing an air-to-air -air guidance system for the SM6. It should actually pack quite a lot of processing power, making the missile quite smart. Now, this is all well and good, but one fundamental question remains. If the key problem was the very long range of Russian and Chinese weapons, then is the AIM-174B capable to match or outrange them? Well, obviously, the performances are secret, and the known numbers of the SM-6 are not of much help. The surface-to-air variant has a booster, the air launch does not. The flight profiles are going to be completely different, so ranges and speed are not in any way comparable. Many heavily biased commentators hailed the advent of this weapon as the decisive turning point in air-to-air -air supremacy for the US, the mythical game-changer. The truth is, without knowing the performance relative to the Chinese and Russian weapons, you simply don't know. But, it turns out that there is a way to know. So, without having the declared data, how do we estimate the performance of the AIM-174? Well, what we are interested in is the maximum range, which by its nature is just a proxy of the kinematic capabilities, as we said before. We could create a dynamic simulation, do a multivariate analysis and draw some conclusions, but we would need to do plenty of assumptions and honestly, the last time I did something like that, I did not have any grey hair. To do it now, I should relearn a lot of stuff that I have totally forgotten. So, being lazy, I took a shortcut. Step 1 is consider all the existing air-to-air -air missiles that are more or less in the same class as the AIM-174. I have chosen 9. PL-12, PL-15, PL-17, AMRAM-C and AMRAM-D, R-77M, R-37M, Astra Mark I and Mika. These are all in service, all relatively modern, and for all of them we have some basic data. Sure, Wikipedia level accurate data, but at least we have something. The second step is listing all these data in a table. In the table, I included the maximum range, the weight, the length, the diameter, and I calculated the internal volume. 
neglecting the nose cone tapering. Now things become interesting. The third step is to identify how well the max range correlates with these features. This means putting the range and each of the features in a chart and calculate the correlation between the two. I want to know which of those is the best predictor for the range. Okay, I am sure those of you who are not familiar with these statistical methodologies are probably now jumping up and down. But, 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 the range depends on the propulsion, the aerodynamics, the flight profiles, the flag painted on the side. This comparison means nothing. Well, since aerodynamics and flight mechanics are not a secret, we can give for granted that nobody has a real advantage on that. The aerodynamic coefficients have a non-negligible dependency on the missile aspect ratio. Sure, some of these missiles have very different wings, but this is a simplification that I'm going to accept for sake of simplicity. What I'm doing is simplifying the geometry of the missile using just two parameters rather than describing its shape. In detail. The energy stored for propulsion, since they are all solid rocket motors, depends on the volume available inside the missile. I am accepting the simplification that the fraction of propellant is similar in each of them. Moreover, since chemistry and nozzle design is another thing that you can learn from a book, I am also assuming that there is not much difference among the propulsion efficiency and the energy stored by unit of volume. And the weight, well, it is surely correlated with what is inside, uh, which is more or less the same uh, for each one of them. Each one has a seeker, a warhead, and a rocket motor. So, which one of these features is best correlated with the range. To calculate it, I use Microsoft Excel and the trendline function, which does a linear interpolation to the least squares. I'm not describing the math, it is enough to know that it draws a line, which is a sort of average line of the nine values for the nine missiles. It also calculates a coefficient called R squared, which measures how well the data distribution fits with the line. The closer the coefficient is to 1, the more the two are correlated. So let's do this exercise for the missile length. R squared is 0.51, a pretty low correlation, which means that if a missile is long, you can't really say that it flies far. Let's do the same for the diameter, and we discover that R squared is 0.75, which is a much nicer number. Fat missiles tend also to fly quite far, somewhat counterintuitively. But if we do the same with internal volume, it is even better, because R squared is 0.8. So, large missiles tend to fly quite far. And this is not unexpected. But the best fit happens with weight, where R squared is 0.83. So, from this analysis, we can say that heavy missiles fly far, and the best predictor of the range is weight. Cool! But, remember, we want to find the range of the AIM-174B. So, how all of this is helping us? Well, this is actually telling us what we need to know. Our trusted Microsoft Excel also returns an equation such that, given the weight, let us calculate the range. OK, you will say, this sounds good, but we don't know the AIM-174 weight. We actually know nothing. So, all of this calculation was for nothing? Well, we actually know the weight. In this picture, we see an inert training unit, sometimes called a mass simulator, which means basically ballast. If we zoom in, we can see the location of the center of gravity and the weight. It's written down there. It is 1,890 pounds, plus minus 14 pounds. That is 857 kilos for the rest of the world. Now, we just need to plug this number into the equation and calculate the range. So, the key parameter to understand if the USA turned around the kinematic disadvantage of the current air-to-air -air weapons if compared with Chinese and the Russian missiles is the max range. We calculate the max range for the AIM-174, and the result is... The result is 620 kilometers, sir. 
what is his right? It is 620 kilometers. This outranges all of them. If deployed at scale with the Navy and the Air Force, it will completely fill the gap and flip the current situation. Considering the shape of the dataset, this range is probably slightly overestimated, but it is still head and shoulders ahead. And even if all the base data are wrong, this range will be wrong too, but in relative terms, the result won't be different. The AIM-174B will still outrange all the other missiles. Obviously, obviously there are several other considerations to do. For example, being a derivative of the SM-6, which costs about 4 million per unit, this is surely an expensive weapon, so producing it in decent numbers may be challenging. It is a big and heavy missile, the F-18 probably can't carry more than two of them, and the same should be true even for the F-15. It is probably too big for the F-16, I don't think it will fit inside the base of the stealth planes, albeit both the F-22 and the F-35 should be capable of carrying it. On the flip side, the versatility of the SM-6 is likely still there, so it may still have a secondary anti-ship role, which is always useful. I am a bit more skeptical about the anti-ballistic role, but, well, you never know. The key question, though, is why this weapon even exists. With the AIM-260 around the corner, why on earth the Navy felt the need to adapt the SM-6 to have a long-range weapon? Well, the only answer that I can think of is that the AIM-260 didn't prove to have the long legs that were requested at the beginning. And they had to admit that there is so much you can get out of a missile with the Amram form factor. So, a very long-range weapon was required to fill the gap and the adaptation of the SM-6 seemed a good compromise. Obviously, the elephant in the room The elephant in the room is how to guide a missile at such a distance, how do you provide the targeting data? And if you want to know how the United States is planning to do it, just watch the video that is going to appear beside me. Thank you for watching and see you there.